So, welcome. <clears throat> Thanks for coming. Um, you've already heard from my lead what Uber is integrated marine biology chemistry. <laughs>
as telecommunication, the number of McDonald's restaurants, water use or population. Since about 1900 to 1950, they've all skyrocketed at an exponential rate. The influence that this has had on our world, so whether that's water use, biodiversity decline, the number of major floods, any sort of major indicator of ecosystem response or environmental response you can think about, they've also spiked. One of the biggest ones that were most interesting to me was the ozone hole. The reason that's interesting to me was it's actually an example of how we shouldn't be overwhelmed by these indicators, that there is hope for action. So the ozone hole back in the 1970s was considered an even bigger issue potentially than climate change. No one figured out, figured out how they were going to solve it, but it was human action. They just turned around and knew what they had to do to fix the problem. Ironically, that time it was Europe dragging its feet and America pushing forward, which is a reverse state of it this time around in responses, but people got out and did things, so it's not impossible. All of this is set behind the background of the fact that we're making the world very different, it's been a long time. So 80 million years ago was at this end, this end of the thing. So this end of the thing is 80 million years ago, you're flying forwards to now at that end of the world. You can see that the open dots are actually um, observations from geological things or cores. The solar dots what we're predicted to do. So you can see we're doing a sharp hook in the way that we're going to make the world be environmentally. So whether that's acidification or temperature. All the background of more than 7 million years. So that's going to have some fairly significant effects. So this is the amount of temperature increase that's happened off Australia already. We're predicted to change by up to 4 to 5 degrees. Australia within by 2050. Uh, sea level rise is going to change by potentially more than a metre. The Southern Ocean is likely to be corrosive for ragged all the way to the surface by the middle of the century, as will some local areas like parts of the Great Barrier Reef, for instance. So we're radically changing the ecological and physical side of the system. So we can see that in the, the case of reefs, so over a third of those are already damaged almost beyond repair, we would say. A third of them are highly threatened. And a third that are roughly in good condition that happen to be in spots that are likely to be very hospitable for them by the middle of the century. So uh, last week there was actually a call put out by 3,000 coral reef ecologists to say we need to do something. At the, again, there's a mixture of hope. So there's people that certainly think that they can turn things around with coral nurseries and things like that. But on the other hand, there's some quite senior thinkers who advise governments who say, right, we need to prepare communities for what they do once those reefs are gone. So they're trying to think ahead of what kind of ecosystems will come into place or what ecosystems they should actually see so that people don't lose their coastal buffers, their food sources and all those kind of, all those kind of things. And again, there's a message of both within fisheries, as obvious as that sounds. So there is a third of the world's fishing, fisheries that are still where overfishing is still happening. But the other two thirds, they're overfishing just means they used to be overfishing. Their stock's still the thing, but it's actually turned around. People have changed how they're using the system. And there's a, another third that's recovered or was never fully exploited in the first place. So the messages that we often get on the news that all the world's going to hell in a handbasket fisheries wise, that all the fish in the sea will be gone by the middle of the century, doesn't actually reflect the fact that about 1995 there was a change in people's attitudes, both the general public and the government really has been a switch in fisheries management to be more and more sustainable. It's actually a positive message, which again gives us hope that we can actually do something if we bring people into fisheries. So a background to this though is that biodiversity is turning over and that's something that both human responses will have to get used to. We'll have to get used to looking at a different set of fish on our plate, for instance. So if we look at the makeup of global fisheries, you can see there's more and more pelagics as we go through time. In Antarctica, places like Antarctica and others like the Gulf of Thailand, has been an enormous shift in what we actually fish, going more, much more to invertebrates. The reason that that's a challenging thing for all aspects of science and society is we don't know an awful lot about the ocean. So as much early as 18, late as 1870, we didn't think that anything lived deeper than the coding zone. But pretty much we've just learned more and more as we go through time. Every single cruise that goes off a place like Australia finds more species than we've ever known to science in that location. There was a cruise off Western Australia recently where 99% of the animals had never been seen by science before. And so it's a fairly developed country that tries to get a handle on its biodiversity. So, um, and if you also think about the census of marine life where they try to catalog everything they do, if you think of the world oceans, you know, this is the coast over here, this is the seabed, this is the surface. This is the bit that we know. We haven't 
sample bits in the middle because we can't get to them with sensors. So there's a huge gap out there in what we do and don't know, which is going to complicate things as we try to try to model them. We're in the midst of the sixth great extinction on the planet, partly or majorly due to what we're doing to the system. While we can't predict what that world will look at the end of that extinction, we do know from past ones that a major component of the system will disappear. That's what's happened every other time when it's been an asteroid strike basalt eruptions or whatever. So we know the system's going to change enormously. We have to be responsive to that if we're going to, to survive that. So the, um, but that's when you get into management. This is where the human stuff really has to kick in. People have to understand why they want to do things and how they'll respond if you're going to be on top of what will be a sustainable management. So this is actually Hammurabi steel that was chiseled out about 5,000 years ago. On that steel is complaining about fisheries management that stocks are overfished, that it doesn't have a control fishermen short of beheading them. And it's not a problem that we've necessarily fixed in the last 5,000 years, which is seems to repeat. So it's something we do have to get to grips with. The problem being is a trade-off. It's not a simple optimization, maximization problem that humans are very good at. It's actually balancing trade-offs, which you know, we're not very good at. So it's not just the environment, it's also the economics, but also the social aspects employment and interactions and the freedom of people to actually change a life into a lifestyle that they're accustomed to. So the role of science in that is to support decisions. So whether that's a destroyed coral reef that can actually be recovered or in the case this is a bay in Tasmania where I live, um, it's actually been quite well recovered now. But the point behind that was that we didn't get anywhere until there was a marriage of social, community understanding and science. So just telling them all science doesn't help if they don't know how to use So this is where the models come. So in all aspects of human life now, flight simulators of one form or another help educate people or, or teach people how to deal with complex situations, whether it's brain surgery, fixing cars, learning to fly rocket launchers, driving planes, learning to ski, which I think you got that one, it's a flat dollar. Um, so yeah, this is where our models can sort of fit into this. We can give people effectively flight simulators to fly the world and see which versions crash and which don't. So, and the reason that this will work, or has worked well in my experience, is that humans are natural storytellers. So the first one up there is what we think Manhattan looked like 400 years ago based on evidence, a picture of a couple of years ago, and then an artist's impression of what it might look like 300 years ago. So people like to tell stories about the past and the future. So the only difference is now that we're going to make base those stories on science and make them internally consistent. This hasn't, this is something that started quite a while ago. So if we think of the climate, back in 1896, Arrhenius got the horse, and all, as all good mathematicians do, he threw himself into a problem to cheer him up. He thought he'd calculate global climate layer by layer by hand for six months. And in the end, he was actually trying to look at uh, ice ages and what would happen if there was a decrease in CO2. But being a good scientist, he said, I'll look at an increase as well, so he spent another six months. And at the end, he decided it would be about a five degree increase if he doubled CO2 at that time. And to be honest, that's about what our models say today. So at least we've done cross check ourselves. <laughs> climate models have got a lot more complicated since then. So if you think about the history of climate models, They've sort of started off with mostly atmosphere and ocean and they've added bits as they've realised there were feedbacks that were really important. We're getting into here, we need to get the people obviously in there. So there's some people bits that influence these, but there's no explicit <coughs> people that are listed in that diagram. <coughs> so for those of we've got quite a mixed background in the audience, but so for those of you who are not climate models, or and for those of you who are excuse any gross generalizations of about points, but basically you have a um, a net a grid that represents the, the oceans and the climate, uh, the oceans and the atmosphere, and then within each one of those grids represent the processes that drive that system. So if we just zoom out on this little cartoon here, you've got all the major ocean processes and how the, that turns around, uh, you know, influence of ice, uh, aerosols that come from volcanoes, not just human emissions. Then you've got some human use of the land cover. So this is where Models are sort of at right now. They're starting to add in this kind of detail in a more dynamic sense. So some of the earliest climate models treated the sea as a very shallow lake and that ice didn't shift. Of all the things you would think would change with a warming world, they would say ice fields are going to be static. So you can see 
why some of those things have to be done. But now we now that we've realized the human part is good as well. And the reason for this is um, because humans don't respond necessarily the way that we think they should. So this is some of the original IPCC, IPCC scenarios about how emissions might change through time. And they're basically created by people sitting down and discussing what could happen in this bit of a storytelling thing. The newest set is actually over here where they've started to bring in more mitigation and more responses. So some reference levels to compare back to here and some ones that really start to play out that mitigation. Now to be honest, as a fisheries modeler, there's my major background. They fell down in one spot. They forgot to have the dynamic response of humans. So they forgot to allow the humans to make it much worse than it currently was. So if we think about the actual observations in emissions, so this little dip here is a bit of an aberration, that's what the GFC did. But you can see that we've since more than compensated for it in the amount of emissions that we're putting out. And we're pretty much not seeing a tail off. None of the descriptive scenarios, even the worst case scenarios, potentially predict the level of emissions that we're actually producing. And that's probably because they didn't build the human feedbacks into the system and the inertia in those feedbacks. They just assumed that people would respond to what is GFC? Sorry? GFC. Uh, the global financial crisis. So when the world went belly up economically there for a little while, the emissions dropped off, the industry kicked back in, in places like Australia, where there was very little signature of the GFC, and so the more than compensated that. Some countries it is though. So Australia, our growth rate is five percent, which is ripping things out of the ground left right centre as well. So we have quite a large contribution <laughs> to that. Um, China and India as well, they have, you know, Europe might be, Europe and America might be in a bit of a depressed state, but the rest of the world is still going gangbusters. Now one of the things of human nature is that we tend to think about things knowing the tools that we already have. So my grandfather was a carpenter and he liked to say, if you only know how to use a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. So we tend to get very myopic about the topics that we know about just apply what we already know. So if you ask the physicists to try and have an integrated model of the world, it would look somewhat like that. If you ask the biologist, and if you ask an economist, what we need is to have a more general handling of all three of those. So I spoke about before that we didn't have humans in those climate models, and what we, what we had was they did try to talk, but literally you would have a physicist run the global climate model, he would email his results to Economist would run an economics model using that physics model as a driver. He would email his results back to the physicist. And by the time he did that as an IPCC, it was taking a decade to get that good plot. We need to be a little bit more dynamic than that. The problem is that people tend to think of themselves, or a lot of the world thinks of itself, as separate to nature. So if we go all the way back to the way that people thought uh, during hunter gatherer societies, it really was intermingled. Quite separate to the world. You can see this in some of the ancient religions. So Hindu is the oldest known religion and they're still a part of that integrated whole. So overconsumption is considered inappropriate in the Hindu religion because you just don't do that. It's an immoral part of the way that the truth works. Unfortunately in the West, uh, two things happened. We, well, they obviously happened in the East as well, the technology side, but in the West we also had Western religions pop up. And with that you can see in the so psychopsychologists Basically, you look through the history, and at that point was when humans suddenly said, actually, we're a steward of the world, we're separate from it. So the Western world took a very big divergence at that point and said, right, we're separate from the world, we can control it and look after it, but we're not a part of it. And that's come to condition pretty much the way that we think in the West about the world. So everything since then, so invention of agriculture, we start to control the world even more, we directly control the world. The way we invented literature and language, that really deeply conditions the way that we think about problems. A really great example of that is how they found the genes for limbs. So they're looking for the gene for four. The English team was looking for one gene because uh, I'm going to get this back I don't know any German. So the, there's a, the Germans were looking for, I'm pretty sure it was, uh, the English were looking for one gene for a limb, a four limb. The Germans were looking for two limbs, for two genes, a limb, and one that made it at the front. And the Germans found it because it was two genes. 
So the way that people were thinking about the question and the language that they used conditioned how they responded to that problem. And so the more that we started to develop things like rational thought and then clinical today, most more people spend time watching television in Australia than actually being outside. They spend more time going to theme parks than national parks. It's a pretty sad statistic for Australia, but it's true. 95% uh, of our population lives in the city in Australia. So there's a very big disconnect. And it's something that psychologists actually worry about a lot. And it does condition the way that we tend to interact with the world. The people of me buying a computer. Or probably the truth in do though is that mathematics has been quite an effective way of representing the physical world even without thinking about people. So we all use weather models on a daily basis. Um, not too many humans in those, so we think that they'll be fine. But what we really need to do is a different way of thinking about the world, so we do have that integration. So thinking back to that little cartoon before, we need to have more of these parts of the system being an act, because it does condition the responses that we see. So what do we have to hand? So we've got economic schools, and they have some that have also been useful to a point. The problem that they have is that doesn't necessarily deal with surprises. So I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the, the term the black swan. So in Europe all swans were white and they said you couldn't have a black swan so they came to Australia where all the swans were black. So you know, that surprise again that can jump up and surprise you. The part that got me when I first started to do it was when you get one of those big economic models in the world, it's not like a physics model where they put in the processes and then see if they can reproduce the past to give you some confidence, they actually drive it. They say, this has already happened, so let's go from here. So it can't naturally reproduce that past by itself, which is a problem when you're trying to see how the processes interact if you're going to do a forecast in the future. Back in 2009, when I first did this slide, you typed the words rational behaviour into Google, you got those two images as your first images. <laughs> they probably are the two extremes, potentially, of rational behaviour. Um, there were some problems on the social science front of trying to bring people's thought processes into models. A lot of social scientists and then a lot of other people thought they can't model humans. That's not actually true. You can model what I would call human climate. So just as we can get a pretty good model of the general climate, but we can't do weather exactly well all the time, you can get a pretty good general model of the way humans behave, even if I can't exactly predict what Barish is going to do at lunchtime. Okay, so we can get that that general human climate okay, and it's because we've figured out that there's some basic collective needs that we all have, food, shelter, that kind of stuff, some contextual stuff. So, for instance, I have children, so they play a big part in what I have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, basis. Then there's some big things that just happen to you, so for me, the global financial crisis was something I couldn't do anything about, it just happened, I had to deal with it. And all of those together come out to be the way that you experience and then how you respond. So if you can break it down the same kind of process way that we're used to breaking down the natural world, then you can get through the So we think about all the different parts of the world, pretty much there are models for all the different parts. What we're lacking is the governance of everything, so we don't do models of that very well yet, but also tying these things together, and we'll give more about that during the So why is an important part? Basically, uh, if you look at the last uh, IPCC report, when we think about uh, whether these where these systems start to have severe problems versus where they can adapt and where they can just cope with the temperature change. If you start to bring in cumulative effects, you can see that those places that it goes from green to orange to red shift quite dramatically. And that's one of the aspects of human nature is to pass on the problem up a little bit at a time, we'll get through with that bit, and then we'll move on. The problem is that it's actually acting cumulatively and synergistically and the direction of that action can change as more things come together. So back in about, I think it was 2008 now, I had a bit of a crack at applying some of the system methods I use to the question. We heard quite a lot from people like Stern and Nagano in Australia how climate change wasn't going to be a big deal. All it would do would take the growth we would see and then drop it by maybe five percent. So we'd still get more than a doubling in GDP and all that kind of stuff. The biggest tiny little twinkle. I started to get suspicious about what was in those models and whether that five percent was as bad as it could actually get. And if you deconstruct those models, five percent is as low much of a drop as it can do. If it gets to five percent, it's actually saying, 
want to go further, it's just that Longbot let me go further. So you've got to feed, put in some of those feedbacks to see what the potential could really be. So all I did was grab existing models from around Australia, I tied them together and chucked in very simple representations, so there's a lot more work to do in this process, but very simple representations of some of the processes that have been assumed to be fixed. So if you can think about a, another example of assumption that you would immediately question, in Australia a population is likely to double by 2050, but most of that doubling will be in people over the age of 65. It's going to be a very heavily aged population. The demography in all the Australian productivity GDP Gardner report has assumed a fixed demography of today, which is the much younger generation. So they weren't looking and thinking about ability to produce things, social welfare issues, all those kinds of things. So we have to have built in some very simple representations of those kinds of issues. Um, what we did is if we thought about some what we think about think about scenarios for a while, I just played with a couple. Some of them were business as usual, so basically don't do anything. Just assume that some magic is going to happen at some point, which seems to be some of the Australian population's attitude. The other end is rising to the challenge. The people actually dug in and said, right, we're going to really embrace this, we're going to try and find new technologies, try and make a green economy, you know, really do something about it, make it a positive rather than a negative. So if we take those scenarios and move forward, you can see over that range of scenarios, we've applied these values today, there's some parts of the system that the damage already done is just going to be too great. So, for instance, acidification is likely to impact the coal regardless now because it's going to have such a long lag time in the ocean. But there's other parts of the system that if you give them the space and because of the effects, the, the nature of the effects of the environmental change, it doesn't have to be a negative story. You can have fish populations that are quite healthy. Tourism and fisheries industries that are quite, quite healthy as long as they're allowed to show adaptation. And there's some really great examples in Australia right now about how some ingrained, well-intentioned responses coming out of communities about concerns is actually preventing social and economic adaptation that would be beneficial in the long term. So the short-term drivers and long-term drivers have collided. On the, on the human side of things, flooding and damage on extreme events is likely to go through the roof, basically, in Australia in the next 30, 40 years. One of the biggest costs will be in our defence. So we have quite a large land mass. Some parts of it will actually become more hospitable under climate change, others much less so. But we're going to have 300 million people in islands throughout all that just have no land left because the seas come up. So in a culture and a nation that's tried to fence itself off from the world by taking refugees and putting them in compounds or sending the boats away in it, it's going to become quite expensive to have that government policy as the world around us changes. So this is all about trying to get people's awareness that having those interactions in there is quite important. Even Australia's energy infrastructure is going to be much less useful with rising temperatures because the power lines itself can be used after electricity as well. They're all still above ground in that state. Okay, so ultimately what would happen was that you could get a rise in GDP if you allowed for innovation, but actually we're more, you know, we're, the time is much more likely. So in Australia, the global financial crisis caused a 1 to 2 percent decline. So, this is talking about a 15 to 20 percent drop in our GDP, which is much more significant than it's even happening in Europe right now. So, without those feedbacks and being forewarned about those feedbacks, there would have been some nasty surprise and frustration. So, basically, there's been a, a tendency to focus on topics that we know a lot about and to sort of think about refining those. Like, okay, well, get these working exactly right before we spread our wings to something that's a little bit more unusual, a little bit more out of the box. And we need to sort of get past that natural intention and say, right, we have to go a bit wider from the start and bring in those critical feedbacks to truly make it a socio-ecological system, so the social and the ecological and the physical together, if we're really going to start embracing answering some of these questions. Because the wicked problems are going to have to require wicked solutions. So wickedly, so that's a bit of a play on words in the way that my children
going to be plenty of time for questions throughout the course of the week as more that gets detailed. But if anyone's got some initial questions now, feel free to fire away. Yep. I'm a little puzzled about the fear of fish on the fishery. So the fish, that, that fish one that went up, that's just the biomass, the stocks of fish. Yeah, yeah. So we can have more fish in Australia if we're sensible about the way that we deal with climate change. So this is just doesn't mean mitigating it, it means that Australia, Australia's oceans are as much a desert as Australia's land masses. So ironically, by having climate change, there'll be parts of Australia that become, in the oceans, more productive because we don't have our willings of present climate, we're the only place in the world that doesn't have strong enough buildings at the coast, so we will get them with climate change. So it's about sensibly using that new resource and adapting to having it available without getting rid of it. There's also lots of new species that are moving to Australia that replaces some of the older species that are for Australia has a lot of invertebrates. We don't have a lot of fish, or as much fish as other nations. So it's about the biomass, it's about the biodiversity, but on the fishery side, it's about the catch and economic profits that they can provide. So both food security but also their profitability. Yeah. Um, one, one thing is interesting in your models, Beth, is uh, how do you include competition between countries, between states, between communities? So I'm going to duck that question by saying I haven't done much at the global level yet. We're lucky in the sense that our continent is a single nation. So where we have done a little bit is I've played with what happens in different states within Australia respond in different ways. And the simple message pretty much is always do the best that you can because there's a benefit even if the other guy's cheating on the other side. So while there's a prisoner's dilemma kind of game theory part behind it, there's actually, in every single way we've tried it, there's always a positive benefit to you doing something. Even if it's just because you bring the aggregate up, so even if the other guy's stealing a bit, you're still not as bad as if you both cracked out the system. Um, but it's also because there's become social pressures, at least within a nation, but potentially internationally as well, from the bottom up movements that are happening for that pressure to come onto them. So places like Iran, for instance, have just started a sustainable fisheries and environmental policy with the green reserve processes and are actively trying to learn you know, the sustainability techniques. So that so that's where you get that link back into the social feedbacks of what they call social norms. The rules of behaviour can shift. So if you just, you know, the old saying my grandmother did, don't lower yourself to the lowest denominator, do what's best for you. If you actually follow that through at a systems level, they can change through that social feedback. The standards that everybody moves to, and so it does change. And you can probably see that culturally if we think back a couple of generations to you know, what my grandfather or great-grandfather wanted out of the ecosystem was very different to what we'd expect today. And it's because of that kind of social feedback. Um, Let's have a five minute break and 